when people are looking for the secrets to become millionaires, you have to start looking at, are you sure you want to pay the price? Are you sure you're ready for the fucking pain? Are you sure? Because it might just be worth for you not to sign up for such a big goal if you're not ready to get punched in the face. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome, welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. This is your host, Jeff Lerner. Grateful to be back with you yet again. I have been blessed with another day and I'm happy to get to use it having this conversation with you. Um, today we are welcoming Raul Velasquez to the show. Uh, Raul is a luminary entrepreneur, educator, coach, uh, author, speaker. Um, he's, uh, I guess, the CEO of ARG which is a major real estate firm. Um, but uh, his passion project seems to be, he created something called the Next Level Experience, which really focuses on men, entrepreneurs, CEOs, businessmen, and the, the, uh, the, the wars that we go fight every day and the lives that we try to build for ourselves. So I'm really excited to have that conversation. Uh, self, selfishly, I'm gonna pick his brain about how to, how to up-level my own life. Raul, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Oh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it, man. I think uh, the timing is right. I think right now we're in the middle of a war, right? <laughs> middle of a war in, in the media, the middle of a war within ourselves. I mean, the country's divided. So now it's, it's the best time to, to start leading. And I think this conversation is going to trigger some people to start thinking a little bit different. And that's, uh, that's always the intention, to give some value so you could actually expand your mind a little bit. Yeah, well, I'm grateful you're here. You're doing so many cool things. And, and I do. I I like that. Let's just call it what it is. It's a war, but it's not a war to destroy the other side. For me, it's a war. Uh, it's kind of like the whole me versus me concept, right? It's a war against the lesser version of myself to be the greater version of myself. Because ultimately, I think the way to unify both sides is to inspire and demonstrate what's possible for human beings. Um, so tell me a little bit about, I guess, back up. So I assume ARG came before Next Level Experience. Yeah, I've been, I've been doing real estate since I was 21 years old. Okay. I built a real estate portfolio. Uh, by the time I was 30 years old, I had multi-million dollar uh, uh, assets. My accountant sent me a letter saying, congratulations, you're 30 years old. You can retire. You have all these assets. You have all this money. You know, I want you to, to teach me <laughs> how to create right. wealth, right? And at 30 years old, I'm thinking, man, I made it. I haven't even put my, my effort yet. I I'm, I'm still hasn't, haven't even hit the prime. But then life comes over and... Uh, and just punches you in the face. 2008 happened, and we pretty much lost it all. And it's, when, I, when I say this story, it's like, it, it, when, when you can relate to people losing everything, it's like, one thing is being broke, another thing is actually being less than broke, meaning you owe the bank millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, it was, I was upside down in some of my assets. So I went from having millions of dollars to actually being millions of dollars in debt. So, so when things like right now with COVID hits and what we're going through right now, for me, it's nothing, man. For me, it's a walk in the park because I've been through this before. I've inspected something like this to happen. So that, could, that kind of gives us some perspective of how to manage things right now in the current economy. You know, that's, that's interesting you say that. And I love that you said life punched you in the face. Uh, I'm not saying I love that it happened, but I love the way you described it. Uh, Mike Tyson is one of my favorite quotes, says everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> Um, and it's, and it's crazy because I thought about it. I mean, on my way to my house after that conversation with my accountant, I was like thinking to myself about all these plans, all these things that I want to accomplish. And when uncertainty hit, we associate ourselves, I speak, you know, for men, right? Uh, Cause I, you know, I, I only, you know, when I talk to my audience, I, I relate to the version of myself, right? Where I was. And as a man, we have an identity in our business. Yeah. So when we're not doing good in our business, that means that it's not worth living. That means that we're less than. So all this shit started to crumble and then my identity got lost in the business. 
Yeah, it's interesting in the uh, in in the cra- the economic crashes. You see these these horrible uh, clips on the news of people jumping out of buildings, committing suicide. It's always men. Yeah, you never you see women right. jumping out of the window because their business crumbles, right? I, I, I think you you know I, I read somewhere that the highest rate of suicide right now is between men from twenty three to thirty five right now in the current market. Wow. And, and when this catastrophe happened in 2008, I mean, it's nothing compared to what are we going through here. I mean, I mean, today is nothing, I mean, compared to what was going on back there, because back right. there, we didn't have social media. So what happened, Jeff, is if I'm fucked in my, in my business right now locally, I can't see what's going on in California in, in real time. I can't see what's going on in Florida because I'm, I'm in, in New York, I'm in Connecticut. So all I saw are banks going under on the news and, and what we did is what we always, you know, know how to do is continue to fight, right? So I just changed the name of my, of my office from one bank to another bank. And then when that bank went under, I went to another bank, another bank. So I think we changed names of banks like four times because I had a mortgage company, had a real estate company, had a construction mm-hmm. investment firm. So all those things, uh, we, did, we couldn't see what the other side was doing that, that, that we could actually start doing to prevent that. So in, uh, where, where are you located? I live in uh, Southern Utah, St. George. Yeah, so so in, in California, all this stuff was going on. It, like the foreclosure hit first in California and it hit us a little bit later. So we didn't have the perspective from California. So I was buy, buying more properties. In the, in, in the middle of chaos, I was still hopeful, thinking that I was going to save my company when the reality is I was throwing money after bad money. So that's how I, I lost everything. Not because I didn't know what to do. It was because I had too much of an ego to let things go because hmm. I had the cash, but I wanted to maintain all this, all these things that I've built. Well, that's an interesting perspective that, that social media by virtue of connecting us and, and illuminating what's going on in areas that we wouldn't otherwise see actually, it sounds like from your, from that perspective, at least gives us a little bit of almost like a mental stability. Whereas, you know, most people would say social media is destroying people psychologically, but that's an interesting way to look at it. So put it this way, when, when COVID hit, right, March of this year, we got locked down here in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. I think it was the opposite. Connecticut got locked down and you guys are just, in Utah, you're just experiencing the lockdown right now. Yeah. You're just experiencing exactly. like yeah. what it's like to have, but we, we've been doing this since, since March. So for example, I have events. We used to, last year, we did an event every single month. I have bootcamp events, guys pay $25,000, uh, per head to work with me one on one in a three day event in a three day boot camp. So we'll have anywhere from seven to twelve guys every month come in to work with me and, and work with my team, right? So then the COVID hits now is zero. Now nobody's coming in, obviously, because we don't want to get sick. Actually, I was in the middle of an event. We had a big event. We had a couple of hundred guys at the um, at this leadership event that I put together. And we had to cut it short because New York announced that the airports were going to be shut down. The people have to just be on the lockdown right in the middle of my event. So there was so much uncertainty. And I, and I said, we, we, it's inevitable that we're, going to get, that we're not going to get hit by this. This is going to affect our business. It's going to, it's going to affect our health. But we need to stay strong. And as soon as I, we finished that event, my wife and I got sick. We got COVID and it was a, a handful of guys who got COVID. I, I, I was surprisingly not that many guys got, got COVID from that event. But that was the beginning of seeing how real this is. But, uh, but right then and then I started seeing how people started to adapt and adjust, doing Zoom meetings, doing virtual events, doing all these things. So now social media is really helping us see, okay, maybe I'm thinking I'm fucked in my, in my, in my business, but if I see somebody else in the West Coast doing something that's similar, then I could actually see, okay, I could do that, or I could do this, or I could adapt and adjust. So I think social media is also helping by, by showcasing what some people are doing in different markets. As before, 2008, we, we thought it was, we were alone. We thought that we couldn't, like, if, if nobody's buying real estate here in this area, that means nobody's buying real estate in, in the whole world. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, I do agree with that. I, I would, I would, add to that my I think my personal belief is that access to more information is generally a fo- a positive thing you know so being able to see into other parts of the world or other you know groups of people that's always a positive thing you know probably goes without saying when that information is being filtered or censored by people with agendas mm. maybe not such a good thing um but that's my that's my little moment of of political 
stumping, if you will. <laughs> but, but, you know, digging on that, one of the things that I did when I got married, uh, this was, we just celebrated 21 years of getting married. I was such an addict uh, to TV, Jeff, mm-hmm. that I vowed when I got married that I wasn't going to connect cable into my, into my, uh, into my house. So, I, so for like the first decade, we didn't watch the news in my house. I was focusing only on, uh, on just, you know, building my business and listening to, to uh, watching, uh, watching video, watching movies and listening to tapes. I don't know if, you know, you, you and I are probably the same age. We still listen to tapes. There was no like uh, YouTube. Back then, you had to listen to motivational tapes you wanna, or CDs, right? right. So, so now, like, I'm so used to blacking out all the media and the negative stuff that's going on because, uh, uh, you know, we're not addicted to that. We just, you know, cut it off. And, and again, again, information is good, but you have to filter it and ask yourself, what is the energy that you're absorbing? Yeah. What, what is that triggering you? What's helping you? Like, it's because I go to some of my family members and I love my family, but, you know, sometimes as a Spanish family, the first thing you hear in the background <laughs> is the news, <laughs> It's a, the Spanish news, otra novelas, you know? So yeah. in the background, every time I go into some of my family members' uh, houses, I always ask them, turn it off because that's just noise. You don't want to get, pro- little by little, we're getting programmed by all these negative things. So we've been uh, thankful. Like my kids don't watch any news. We don't watch the news. We just, you know, cut it off because we know that's an energy that, that we don't need. We choose to see and have perspective. Okay, what's out there? And we get educated, but we're not addicted to news. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what a, what a theme that is across these Millionaire Secrets interviews about people being extremely discriminating about what they allow into their consciousness. And, and like you said, even just having it on in the background, there's a temptation to let it be contagious. And it's like, no, just shut it off. I mean, that seems to be a universal trait of high performers. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think I'm just going to, I was kind of going to try to go there later in the conversation, but my heart is like, I really want to know about this next level experience. I really want to know about the work you do with men um, to try to juggle and, and be the kind of the enlightened warriors, you know, to use your, your war analogy where it's like, we're fierce, man. We can go fight the battle, but then we can turn around and, and hug our children and love our wife and, 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 you know, apportion our time in a way that actually reflects our priorities, not just pay lip service to family, but then work all the time. Like, tell me a little bit more about, first of all, how you got into that and, and then some of the work that you do. So one of the things that I love about, you know, when I signed up you know, to do the interview in this podcast was that your theme is millionaire secrets, right? Like everybody wants to be a millionaire. Everybody thinks like the moment I have the money, then all my problems are gonna be solved. But you know, here's what I believe. Money is just going to expose all your problems. Yeah. Oh, just, yeah. I think Biggie said, more money, more problems, right? Yep. So the moment that you're making money, then you realize, oh shit, you know, I'm not taking care of this. I'm not taking care of that. So then as men, what we do, we, we try to put band-aids on wounds mm-hmm. and we think money is going to solve our problems. So that's what I did. You know, I wasn't working on myself. I didn't, I didn't take care of my physical health until I, I had to, like I was physically sick. You know, I, I thought in my mind, I said, I'll work out when I'm a billionaire. Like the moment that I have, you know, a billion dollars in assets, then I could work out. I used to joke around all my friends that would be at, be at the gym. I think that they're going to be broke because I didn't take care of my body. Same thing with my wife and my kids. I said, you know, once I have the time, then I'm going to do something. Once I have this, then I'm going to do something. Then when the market hit, I had no choice but really see, you know, what I have, what I truly have. And I realized that, you know, coming home and, and being honest with my wife, telling her that, listen, I they don't have the money to pay for the mortgage. It's either the mortgage or is the office. And I need the office to continue to create revenue. Mm-hmm. And we might have to sell the house. And I was ready to, to, you know, just live in my office. I was ready for her to just move to her parents and, or move to her family and have a divorce. I was ready for that. One of the things that she said to me was, I know who you are and I know that you're going to build it back. I will live under a bridge if I had to, but you need to go there and fucking fix this. So that's the first time that I actually, something ignited inside myself that I realized like, shit, I have the power to fix this. Like I put ourselves in this mess. I have the power to go there and hunch. So what I did, Jeff, for the next six months after that conversation is I started just digging into personal development because I needed the motivation. I was so depressed. I was so down in myself because again, we associate our business to identity. So when your business is failing, that means that you're a failure, right? Mm-hmm. So then I listened to a Tony Robbins uh, CD and he said, in the moment of chaos, there's always opportunities that you always have to, you know, look for the opportunities. And I stuck to me. 
And I start asking myself, where's the opportunity? Where's the opportunity? I don't know if it was God or, or like, you know, the universe give me like a, like a little bit of a, of a hint. I get an email from a, from a marketer. <laughs> That's what I love marketers, man. Like, mm-hmm. like digital marketers saved, saved my life because a marketer sent me an email saying, sign up to this webinar to learn how to buy distressed assets. So I didn't know anything about marketing at that point. I didn't know I was falling into a funnel. You know, I was <laughs> falling into a, 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 an offer, right? So I go into this webinar and this guy is talking about like, yeah, everybody's losing houses. Everybody wants to give away the houses. So the biggest opportunity right now is buying distressed assets. You could contact the banks. The banks are willing to, to give you these properties almost for free. Yeah. I said, right now, sign up for this course in Vegas. It's $10,000. I'm going to teach you all these tricks, so all the secrets. <laughs> about buying foreclosure properties. And I didn't have the money. I'm like, shit, but, I, but that was an opportunity. It, it made sense. All this, this, this pain points that he was uh, painting in the webinar made sense. So I put the 10K on my, my, on my MX knowing that I had to pay the next month. I probably wasn't, wasn't going to be able to pay next month. Mm-hmm. I flew down to Vegas. I sat down. There was about probably 25 people there. And it just, man, it just clicked. It just clicked that right now, it was prime. Opportunity was prime. There was thousands of properties being foreclosed and, and banks needed somebody to manage them, to take care of them. Mm-hmm. So what I did, I knew I had 30 days to make at least $10,000. So listen, I cold called every single bank that there was on the list. They sold me a list. There were about a thousand banks in, in the whole country. And I cold called every single bank until one bank gave me an opportunity and that bank made me millions of dollars out of just that one phone call. Hmm. That's so, I mean, profound. I, I, I hope everybody lets that sink in for a second, that it was months and months of stress and strain and tens of thousands of dollars and all this, and that literally within all of that, it was one, literally just one single phone call that, that became the, the out, right? Yeah. How, how many phone calls did you make before that one phone call? So, and, and that's why I joke around because I said every single day I will sit on my desk and I will make at least two to three hours of phone calls, phone calls, emails, phone calls. And everybody, and because it was such a saturated uh, list at that point, people were not picking up. So how I got my big break is somebody got fired and then somebody picked up the line that wasn't supposed to mm-hmm. and actually had a live person. And then I automatically, I just said, hey, give me a chance. What are we to do? And she said, Come to meet me next week in my office. I said, you know, give me the address. And it was in Dallas, Texas. And I flew the next week to Dallas, Texas, had lunch in, the, in, in their office. And that conversation turned into millions of dollars of, of, uh, of assets. But then that also created a ripple effect because now that bank took to another bank. And that all of a sudden, we were just managing hundreds of properties and thousands of properties from other banks because of that conversation. So, uh, so at that point, I knew that for me, I had no option. Like mm-hmm. I, I knew I had to make it work. And I think that everybody who's listening to this, whatever you're going through right now, you have to burn the fucking boats. Like if, uh, entrepreneurs, that's, what we, that's the moment that you really truly uh, feel that you're in the battlefield, that you can't turn back. You know, that you, you, you turn back and you're dead. You got to keep moving forward. And that opportunity gave me the, uh, the chance for me to start really rebuilding. So... There's an interesting dynamic in your story that I feel like could be an escape hatch sort of objection for a lot of people that might hear your story and, and well, they'll try to separate and go, oh, that doesn't apply to me. And here's what I mean. So you fell on hard times and you had a wife that said, I believe in you. You can fix this. Now go do the work. And, I, and so then you said, okay, so I'm, burn, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going all in. I'm going to burn my boats. I'm going to work on myself. I'm going to pour myself into any opportunity I can find. And you made it work, right? I could see some people, you know, particularly men, let's say, because I'm seeing it through my lens too, saying, well, but you had a wife that supported you. Now, a different wife, a different marriage could have said, you need to go get a job. I'm sick of you taking risk. I'm sick of you being an entrepreneur. I want safety or else I'm divorcing your ass. And there are marriages like that, right? So the point is, and it's kind of like the Navy SEALs say, start getting ready now because by the time you need to be ready, it's too late to get ready. You had obviously been planting seeds with your wife. You had been winning that battle prior to that moment, which is why that moment went your way. What do you say to men who are like, look, I want to go all in. I want to bet on myself. 
but my family are essentially handcuffing me because they don't believe in me or they're so fixated on their perception of security that they'll cut my balls off if I try to take a risk. So, uh, so here's my answer to that is I, I, early on in our marriage, I was the one taking risks, gradual risks. Yeah. To the point that she eventually saw the, um, the drive that I had. For example, when we bought our first property, I asked her to sell her car. So she was, you know, we, we saw her car so we could have the down payment mm. to buy the house. <laughs> so I've always put her in situations where she had to trust me. And I think that she saw at that moment that I was giving up. And, and if we don't put in, like, like, and I tell the story because that gave me leverage of, for men. It's easy. Like, listen, I will live in a basement. I don't, I don't need a fucking house. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> you right? and I will live in a fucking cave and I will put, you know, our, the TV on and our computers and we're, we're good. Why do men want to build kingdoms and empires? Because we want to create something for somebody else, for a family, oh, for a legacy. Oh, so true, man. My word, so true. So then when my wife said, okay, I will live under a bridge if I have to, just, just those words, I will live under a bridge if I have to. I, at that moment, I couldn't see my wife living under a bridge. Like, fuck, I will fucking go and kill myself working <laughs> my ass off yeah. to avoid that. So what I, what, what I want people to get is that there has to be leverage. At that moment, my wife had leverage of me saying, hey, it, easy, it, easier, it, it would have been easier for her to say, okay, I'm going to go to my, to my mom. I'm going to you know, take the kids. You figure shit out. It wouldn't have gone the, different, uh, uh, the same way. The leverage that she gave me was like, listen, we, we're on this together. Like, we're going to live under a bridge. You better figure this shit out. Right. So, uh, so the, I, want, I want people to understand that what she gave me was not like a pad, like, go get them. It was like, no, motherfucker, we're fucked. <laughs> so yeah. we, we, you don't think that I'm going to go to my mom. It's not going to be that easy. Because I think that's the mentality that we all have. It's like, okay, I'm going to divorce her. She's going to go with her mom. My figure's like, no, you have to pay the price. For me, what, what I meant is leverage. Like, shit, I can't have my kids living under a bridge. I can't have my wife living under a bridge. I will live under a bridge. Right. I'll probably be fine. But not my wife and kids. So that was my leverage of pain that, I will, that, that would drive me to do what I did. Yeah, it's in 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 the word you're using is leverage. What I'm hearing is to to ratchet up the pain in your life to a point where it's truly intolerable. Yeah, a lot of times is what you have to do to light the fire to go do the work. And like for you, you're like, look, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't me living under a bridge is not painful enough. But having to see my wife and my kid live under a bridge, that's intolerable. So I'm gonna go do whatever I have to do. So, so now you take that and what I do with men is, I, you know, when men come to work with me and I always tell them, listen, I'm not here to motivate you. I'm not going to take your pain away. Because guys, they, you know, guys will come and say, listen, I have so much pain in my marriage, so much pain in my business. I'm this, listen, good. But here's the reality. You don't have enough pain to do something about yep. it. Yep. That's the reason that you are where you are. My job is to take out the fucking Band-Aid, put some salt and alcohol in the fucking pain so you can start healing it. Because that's, that's the only way we're going to move forward. When the pain is big enough that you actually have to do something about it because going backwards is not an option. Yeah, I love that. I, I honestly feel like that's, that's such a part of my job too. Is like a, I'm a pain agitator. I'm a, I'm a pain, you know, I'm, I'm not the one who's going to come take, take away your pain, but I am going to come take away the drug so that you can't numb it anymore. Yeah. Um, and so and that, that's, that's what happens after, after a while. Then, okay, we get comfortable. Because Jeff, like I'm looking at your, your background, you have a, a, a $10 million plaque in the back of your, uh, of, in, your, in your studio. That doesn't come from like, people look at that like, oh, you're awesome. No, there was blood, sweat, and tears. I know what it takes to build a $10 million business. Like shit, like I know because there's times that you were like, oh fuck, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do it? How is this gonna happen? So, so when, when people are looking for the secrets to become millionaires, you have to start looking like, are you sure you wanna pay the price? Are you sure you're ready for the fucking pain? Are you sure? Because it might just be worth for you not to sign up for such a big goal if you're not ready to get punched in the face. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I, I uh, literally, I would say the, the reason that I've had the success I've had in the last several years, it, it's not because of anything I learned from business or marketing or you know some special piece of software. Honestly, man, I, st I made enough money that I finally felt like I can deal with my problem. I mean, I made enough money, like some money, not like rich money, but just like enough money that I was like, you know what? I'm tired of 
being who I am, I'm going to go get help. And I started going to therapy. At least I could afford a therapist. That's the work. If I could convey any message to the world, it's the deep pain, like wretchedly painful work on myself is the catalyst for my success now. It's not something that just happened at the same time. It's literally the indispensable part of the process that allows me to do what I do now. And, and it sounds like for you, that crucible of 2008, losing everything, having to picture your family living under a bridge. I mean, would you be who you are now without that? I'm, I'm actually, I'm so, I'm so thankful and grateful that, that happened because I probably would have been divorced. I probably would have been on drugs. I probably would have been all those things that you see out there with guys who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, but they're depressed and they're not happy because they, they just didn't know how to fail. They just didn't learn how to take the punches. I'm coaching one of my, my clients now and he just went through a hard divorce. He had to pay about $50 million in divorce, but he was worth half a billion dollars and, and he was going through a divorce and he, like, and, and he was crumbling. I'm like, motherfucker, you, you build a kingdom. Like you build hundreds of millions of dollars and, and this is not going to end you. This is, not, this is not the worst. And I had to walk him through every single day, coach him through that after a while, he actually saw the truth. The truth is that we are our worst enemy. That, that we think that like, what we're going through is the worst that could happen. Because I remember 2008, when that happened, man, I thought that was the worst that could ever happen to me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that shit, that was nothing because it'd be worse moments. But now it prepared me with enough emotional intelligence to have emotional fitness. See, emotional intelligence is not the same thing as emotional fitness. A lot of people are preaching about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is great. You're intelligent enough to know that you have pain. Emotional fitness is, are you willing to face the pain and take the punches and keep on going? That's, that's the difference between knowing I have to go to the gym, I'm intelligent enough knowing I have to go to the gym, and actually getting in the boxing ring and sparring a couple of times and still coming back over and over again until you get stronger. Yeah. I mean, hey, I love that actually. I'm, I'm cataloging that and I'm going to come back to it often. The difference between emotional intelligence and emotional fitness. Um, that's powerful. So I want to make sure I tie up something that I've been thinking about. It's kind of like lingering in my mind from what you said earlier um, with the dynamic with your wife. And, and tell me if your experience is the same as mine, where working with and I don't exclusively focus on men, but I'd say I probably get about 80, 75, 80% men in my world just because, I don't know, they see me and they're like, relate because I'm a man. But um, this idea of like, my family doesn't support me, doesn't support my dreams. I mean, that is a pernicious problem that, at least perception problem that limits a lot of men from going after their potential. Is that something you see a lot too? Yeah, and I'm, I, I'm writing a book, actually, a book is going to come out in 2021, it's, it's talking about the stages of every single man, right? So from my experience, every man is going to go through a stage. The first stage is the peasant stage, right? The peasant stage is the one that, that, that is looking for somebody to save them, that somebody to, to, to help them, and that's, we all go through that, right? At the beginning of our, we look, I want you su to support me, I want you know, people to do the work for me, I want people to help me, but then after you go to that stage, you go into the warrior stage, right? The warrior says, like, listen, I don't give a fuck who think, you know, if, if you don't think I can make it, I'm going to step into that warrior stage to make shit happen. I'm going to go and do whatever it takes, whether my wife is supporting me, whether my neighbor is supporting me, whether everybody's supporting me. You get into a, a, a stage, an energy field of being a warrior that you're going to make shit happen. But see, what happens in a warrior stage is that we get our significance from our business. We get a significance from our prestige. We get significance for the money. And then when something like 2008 happens, then you lose that warrior energy and you become what I call a sedated warrior. And a sedated warrior is one who looks good, but is still underneath is full of fear and uncertainty. And that's when men go into what I call the tunnel. And the tunnel is where a lot of men right now are stuck. They're stuck in that tunnel energy where I'm, I'm good, I'm good, but there's a lot of unresolved issues that you've dealt with, sexless marriages, uncertainty, fear about losing everything. That's what I was. You know, and then at the beginning, a lot of men who are waiting for their wives to support them, they're in that, that the beginning warrior stage, but they haven't gotten the balls enough to say, fuck it, I'm going to fucking, even if I fail, even if I fail, I'm going to give it, I'm, I'm going to try it. Because I'd rather, a woman wants somebody to, to try shit. Even if you fail, own it. I said, okay, it didn't work. I'm going to go back to get a job. At least you, you gave it everything. You don't live with regret. So the moment that you start really seeing those stages, then you, you start asking yourself, where am I right now? If, if you're thinking like a peasant, but by thinking that you're a king, 
then it's not gonna, you're not in alignment with what you want or who you are. So you have, if you're thinking like a warrior and a king, you have to start thinking how a king thinks. How does a warrior think? Mm-hmm. And if you're in the, in the middle of the tunnel, that's what, that's what the next stage for me was. Right, right after I came back from, from, from losing everything, I was making more money, but then the uncertainty hit, Jeff. And I, I believe those were the darkest moments because that's when, when it didn't make sense for me to be depressed. It didn't make sense for me to start drinking. It didn't make sense for me to start thinking suicidal thoughts. All those things were based on all resolved issues that I had from the past that I was reflecting on my present moment. Even though I had the money, even though I had my wife and kids, even though I had my business, and that's the most dangerous place to be when you perceive, the people perceive that you have it all, but inside you're crumbling and you feel like, like, this, is, like that it, this is not enough. And that's the most dangerous place. The tunnel is where I see men dying, depression, and, and like a lot of toxic relationships that we see right now. So is there, is there, on the other side of the tunnel, when you come out of the tunnel, is it a return to warrior? Or is there something that you can transcend warrior to be more enlightened and less, less defined by your external circumstances? So at, at the end of the tunnel, you find the, the king version of you. So the king version knows how to shift. The king knows how to tap into the warrior energy. The king knows how to, how to determine that you know, when he's acting like a peasant, that the king is driven by purpose. And that's, that's why right now it's so important for men to start seeing that our purpose is really to tap into that king energy as we go through the stages, especially what's going on right now. There's a lot of men who thought they were kings, but now they're acting like warriors. They're going out in the fucking streets, burning shit to the ground because yeah. shit didn't go their way. You know, so now start asking yourself, what, what would a king do? What's that king mentality? So the moment that you start thinking like a king, even if right now you don't have your kingdom, even right now the money's not there, even right now like the business may not be there, but you, you start with the end in mind. You start thinking, what would a king do? What's the version of myself as a king so you could actually reverse engineer the steps in your business and in your marriage and in, your, in every area of your life? Man, I got to say, I love this this model you've set up of peasant warrior king. And the thing that, the thing that strikes me about it, like I've, I've always kind of had this, I remember I read this article once like 12 years ago. It was right around the time I was at rock bottom. It was 2008. My, my wife was divorcing me. I was a broke loser. I was depressed. I was out of shape. It was like my lowest of the low, kind of same timing as you, you know, again, opportunity in the chaos. You went to real estate. I went to digital marketing, but same result. Um, but at that time, I remember reading an article about beta males, the epidemic of the beta male, this like very effeminized, submissive man that basically is how you describe the peasant. It's somebody that's worried about being acceptable, worried about being pleasing, not wanting to get in trouble. They don't want to get whipped in the field. They want to, you know, they're, they're completely dependent on the world around them for even their basic sustenance. And they would say, well, I just love and care for my family. But you're not fighting for your family. You're begging for your family. Yeah. You, Whereas you the king is, is the needy energy. Like you need them. If you lose them, then, then you feel like the world ends. Yeah. Whereas the king, I mean, you could argue nobody loves their family more than a king. In fact, the king considers his whole nation to be his family. And he cares for all, of, assuming he's an enlightened king and not some you know, dictator asshole. But um, there are two different energies around how you love and care for people. And I'm curious if you, if you know, you do work specifically with men, like, do you run up against this like peasant slash what I'm calling beta male sort of epidemic and like really submissive, uh, almost backwards energy? And, and how do you, how do you tackle it head on? Cause honestly, for me, I don't have the patience for it. It just makes me nuts. So, so here's the patterns that I see, like we are Kings in our business, but when we come to our relationships and our, on our family, we're peasants. So there's nothing worse to see in a man when he doesn't know why he's having challenges because he's acting like a king in, in his business and then he's getting all the significance from his employees, from the money that he's making. But then back at home, there's no polarity. There's no polarity because now you become the pleaser. Now you become the yes man. Why? Because we don't have enough energy to deal with that shit. So the, the, the moment that you start owning, there is no separation. If you're the king in your business, you have to be also a king with everybody else. That doesn't mean that, that what you say goes. It means that what's the energy that you're exuding with your family, with your kids? Are you making decisions based on expansion or based on fear? Mm. If you're making this based on fear, then you're always going to attract more fear. 
So a perfect example is a guy who, you know, has 200 employees. He came to my program. His wife told him, you know, we're getting divorced. And I, like, actually, my, my, my event, he, he said, like, was the last resort. Like, his wife was like, go to this guy. If this guy can fix you. Like, you know, that's it. We, we're done, right? And the guy loves his wife. But he, you know, he just, you know, they can't be with each other. So when he came back after the program, he goes to his wife and said, give me 100 days. Just 100 days. And then after 100 days, we'll, I'll give you the divorce. And in 100 days, he just became a fucking solid rock and working on himself, Jeff. I'm telling you, this guy, he took care of himself. He started just showing up the way that he showed up in his business and his marriage. He wasn't, he wasn't an asshole. He just started to own who he was, remembering. Again, I, I, I tell people, I don't, I'm not here to teach you anything. I'm, I'm here to help you remember who you are. Mm. So then he started to remember what it's like at the beginning, how he was making decisions, how he wasn't, he wasn't complaining. He wasn't taking, you know, like he wasn't being the yes man. He was actually speaking his truth. And all of a sudden, a hundred days, the wife was like, I don't see me at She goes, I don't know what you did to this man. <laughs> this is the man that I fell in love with at the beginning. Thank you for bringing him back. So like stories like that is that like you can't make the, and this, and his business went to the roof because all of a sudden now the same energy of leadership his, his employees were like, man, this guy fucking cares. This guy has a different, he's not whipping us down. And yeah. because he was getting beat down at home, now guess who gets the fucking whip? The, the, your employees, right? So he, everything started to flourish the moment that he realized, why the fuck does he do what he do? Why does, why does he show up? It's the different energy. And the king energy is the one that is always going to expand. Yeah, and it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting litmus test for a man. I'm thinking about myself and my business. You know, I run a business with, you know, quite a, we have quite a large team and then I go home and I, you know, I, I, I serve my household. I don't think that I get stepped on. I think that I'm there with a heart for service. And I'm thinking, do I need to flip flop? Do I need to like take off one mask and put on the other between business and home? And I'm kind of happy. I like, I don't really think I do. I think I've got a pretty consistent groove. And may, I wonder in your, in your estimation, if you think that's actually a decent measure of operational effectiveness is that if you're showing up the right way to your home and to your business, and, and I, I would use the term maybe servant leadership to describe it, that you actually shouldn't need to change from one to the other. Do you agree with that? So, so here is one of the key things that I, you know, I talk about in, in the program is becoming the, the experiencer, not the experience. So now you have the king energy. Now you have the warrior energy. Now you have the peasant energy. But at the end, none of them are you. Like, Jeff, you are the awareness of all those archetypes. You are the awareness. So as the king energy, there's a higher version of you. There is the, the co-creator with God energy. Now, this shit is what gets interesting because the co-creator with God energy, that's the guy who's like, okay, what business am I, I am in? What business should I be in? How can I move these pieces? Who needs to show up? And that's the one that attracts, becomes a magnet of what you create. So when I started looking at the next level experience for me is an experience to allow the consciousness of every single leader to expand and evolve to see what can we co-create. If we really want to manifest millions and abundance, then who do you need to become? Yeah. Who need to become in the marketplace? Who need to become as a leader? And then again, sometimes the war energy needs to come out to handle some shit. But where do I live? I, I, I try to become the awareness of, my, of, of who I'm showing up as. And one of the things that my wife and I discuss, and we have a podcast called The Got Money and, and uh, Purpose Podcast, and we talk about shifting, right? When I come home, I take off all the bloody armor as a king, as a warrior, leave it in the driveway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I shift from, from one version of myself to the, the lover, the, the father, the king that's actually, I'm, I'm there for my kids, for my wife, because they don't need to see the battles that I've been through. They know of them. Yeah. But they don't, need to, they don't need to feel that energy. When I'm there, I'm there to connect with them. I'm curious, and I know we're about out of time, but I, literally out of self-interest, I just have to ask, do you have like a routine or a, 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 pro, a formal process you go through where you essentially you shed the warrior garb and, and switch into, like I, I like the way you described it. It's about selecting a different setting for your energy. It's not, it's not becoming a different person, but do you have a, some like some you know something you do that allows you to flip that switch pretty quickly because sometimes i get home and i'm like listen guys i need like 30 minutes so i, I believe everything has a ritual jeff like yeah. rituals really anchor um the shift faster right so in the morning i have a, a crazy morning ritual in the morning where i tap into like let go of who i was yesterday because I'm, I'm big on letting go of the past 
Like you and I, we live in the future. We're like most entrepreneurs, we're visionaries. We need, our job is to create the present moment based on how we see the future going, right? But if we struggle, if you look at your past experiences, every time you felt stressed, every time that you felt like you didn't have energy is because you were focusing on the shit that you did in the past. Mm -hmm. so every single morning, what I do is I let go of who I was in the past and I le learn, you know, get the biggest lessons from the past so I could bring it to the present. And I really stretch myself to like, who do I need to become 10 years, 20 years from now? So I could grab that energy and bring it forth. And I get clear on the three things, not 300, three things that I need to complete this week. I go to the three outcomes, three outcomes, the three musts and the three wins. I focus on those three things. Three wins. Where am I winning? The three outcomes. What do I need to do to get close to my ultimate vision? And three musts. What, who I must become? Who must be impacted? What are the musts in my life? Mm -hmm. So that's the morning ritual. And then at, uh, right before going to bed, you know, uh, before going home, what I do is I just, I, I really, what I do is I just go and, and today I don't have my next level t-shirt for whatever reason. The first, the first time that I'm not wearing a next level t-shirt, but 99% of the time I'm wearing my next level t-shirt. So what I do is I go to the closet and I change from my next level t-shirt to another next level t-shirt. It's just the ritual of just putting, you know, taking off your clothes and putting something else. Mm -hmm. It just creates that transcendence energy to become a different version of yourself. That's so cool. Yeah. I, that, that's, that's what I was going for was, a, was the ritual. Um, well, listen, I, I, unfortunately we really are out of time. I, I'm like, I feel like I'm just getting warmed up in my mind. If I have a million questions I want to ask you, but, Maybe I, maybe I should just come to one of your events. Uh, well, let's see. We could do a follow-up. Uh, we could do a follow-up uh, conversation. But, you know, definitely what I would love for your audience to, to get out of this is that whatever you, we're going through right now in this current market is really what I believe is the shift that's necessary for growth. Mm. When, whenever there's uncertainty, like one of my um, teachers, because uh, I, I read a lot of energy work, a lot of consciousness, and I said, in order for the, the shift to happen in, in consciousness it has to come from a disruption. So right now, our beliefs, our, our community is being, has been disrupted, right? Our base has been disrupted. Don't take this, uh, this as a bad thing. Don't take this as something that, that, oh, it's the end of the world. Take this as an opportunity for you to, to really start asking yourself, who must I become so my grandkids could reap the benefits? Yeah. And right now, certainty is the new currency. Like as a man, as a woman right now, you have to be certain that you're here for a reason. You have certain that you have a purpose. Like I love, I love that you, you know, you focus on becoming a millionaire, but a millionaire without purpose is penniless. There's so many millionaires out there with no purpose. And uh, I read somewhere, I think this morning, somebody sent me something like people are so poor that the only thing they have is money. So if, if, if you want to have wealth, have purpose. Purpose is the core that's going to ignite every single aspect of your life. Yeah, you know, there's a saying by in politics, or, or it was said by Rahm Emanuel, the, the mayor of Chicago, he said, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. I think people hear that and they kind of dismiss it as like political, um, you know, like Machiavellian, uh, like it's something that's negative. But in your personal life, that's 100% the truth. Never let a good crisis go to waste. This is a crisis, perhaps of, of you know, epic proportions in your own life. That means don't let it wait. Don't wake up next year and realize you're still the same person that went through this crisis. So um, much opportunity, man. So much opportunity. And, oh, and when, you think, like, when you think right now, like, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm, I'm fucked because I have my business not doing good. Like, I was, I was on the phone with the owner of Spartan uh, Race. And I, I text him, I said, hey, man, how you doing? I'm checking in with you because I check with a lot of these guys because, listen, the bigger the business that you have right now, the more pressure you have. So I checked in with him and he was like, yeah. Um, I said, what, what, you know, is there something I could do for you? Like, like uh, you know, I'm here for you. Let me know if, if you need to talk. He goes, yeah, you want to do something for me? Just lend me $10 million. <laughs> and, I, and I laughed and I said, you want it in, in big bills or small bills? Because <laughs> at the end of the day, these guys, like there's so much pressure or yeah. the bigger the business there is, that sometimes if, you, if right now, uh, I'm, the problems that I had back in 2008, I wish I had those problems now because this is <laughs> small compared to the shit that I'm going through right now. But yeah. there's also the opportunity that's out there, Jeff. Like if one thing as entrepreneurs, we are opportunity creators and we have to create the opportunity when there is, like I'm so excited right now for 2021, man, because I know that, listen, 2020 is, it gave us an awakening 2021, I'm calling it the rise of the empire. 
Like we yeah. have to fucking rise and we have to lead. That's a great note, uh, I think, to end on. How can people go get more of your greatness and get into your world socially and also through your experience? So, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a website, thenextlevelexperience.com. Just check out the video if, if, you wanna, if you wanna come to one of our boot camps. But connect with me on Instagram, uh, Raul the Edge. I'm in Instagram, I'm in Facebook. Instagram is probably the best, um, the best way. And also I have a text community. I'll give you the number. You could text me directly. And this text community goes right to my phone. And I do a lot of content in my text community. And I want to really build a text community. The number is 203-405-9199. 203-405-9199. Just text, uh, text me Edge and I will add you to, um, to a daily podcast, that I, a daily rant that I send to my clients every single day. Cool. Yeah. And we'll make sure we get those links and the, the community number uh, in the description. Um, Raul, I just want to say thank you, man. This has been wonderful. Um, we actually did, uh, did put a, a special offer together for everyone. Uh, it's basically just a way to, to go deeper in our world. And, and we'll know that Raul sent you. If you go to millionairesecrets.com forward slash Raul V, you can get our free ebook and subscribe to our podcast and such. Um, Raul, this has been wonderful. Thanks for being a guest on Millionaire Secrets. Listen, and I love that you're doing this, man, because so many people out there need to know that they, they, the number one secret is to do something. Like if you, don't, if you don't click on that call to action that this guy is giving you, man, you're missing out because you, you, you probably right now either consuming information for the sake of information or consuming information to do something about it. The number one secret is do something about your situation now. Amen. Amen. Sitting still is uh, rarely a strategy. <laughs> Thanks, Raul. Thank you to everyone out there in the Millionaire Secrets world. We appreciate it. You're the best part of why we do what we do. Take care. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.